Thanks everyone for attending this morning. We yeah, want to welcome you today and, and say thanks for getting up early and, and making the, the time to come in. Um, we're pleased to announce and continue to kind of beat the drum this year that this is our 25th anniversary. Uh, it's hard to believe that 25 years have gone by, but, but it has. It's an exciting time with all the different things that are going on. Uh, it's hard to believe that he, almost a year ago we moved to this location here at Providence Towers, since there's a lot of great things that are taking place. Um, we're working to have some other different events and stuff this year as part of our 25th, and so you'll be hearing about some of those things. There's a couple different things sitting there in front of you today. One is the CPU evaluation form. Uh, we would like for you to fill that out and return it at the registration desk. Um, if you want CPE credit for you know, CPAs, um, that kind of stuff, let us know. Also, there's an evaluation form there for the actual program itself. We're always open to looking for topics and new and different things that we can include. Um, you'll notice that just like today, that we try and find things that we think are out and around topics that are necessary to, to listen to and talk about in the business environment that we all work in today, but not necessarily just financial, accounting, tax, things like that, which you would typically think the CPA firm. Because we understand the reason for Aspire is that people are aspiring to extend their knowledge out a little bit further, so we're really trying to work on that. But if you'll make sure and fill those out for us, we really covet your feedback on the topics as we're beginning to look and, and see what we can do. There are also some handouts and videos of prior sessions that, that are available on the website. We have a video vault there. You'll notice today that we're videoing this, as we always do. But those are there. We break them into actually smaller segments, too. So you don't have to listen to a whole program, but you can go and pick out specific topics and things from those various areas that you want to hear about. Um, and the March session, by the way, is now available on the website for viewing and stuff. Well, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Terry Bennett. Terry is a strategically minded difference maker. He improves business results through people, processes, and technology, specifically in that order. Terry partners with others to establish a vision for the use of technology that's in complete alignment with the corporate strategic plan. He empowers people to accomplish this in creative ways while helping them remove roadblocks and discover ways to accelerate their return on investment. His team is coached to be business professionals, not simply technologists, and he works to tear down the walls that too often exist between IT and the typical business people. Terry seeks ways also to identify ways that can differentiate his company and their firm from its competition while generating ideas to reduce costs and help increase revenue. In addition, he delivers a level of satisfaction that absolutely delights those he serves. This morning, he's gonna talk about technology-related business disruptions, pitfalls to look out for, and how we can better protect ourselves and our information online. We had asked him to come and talk today specifically because of all the things you're about hacking and stuff like that, and what we can do and how we can make that work. Terry was very, made me feel really comfortable just thinking about all the financial data we had, because he told me, he said, you'll never be protected. So that makes me sleep really well. <laughs> <laughs> Let me welcome Terry. Thanks, man. Thank, you. Thank you. This morning, my, my purpose is to excite you, and honestly, to make you a little scared about the things that are going on in, out in your business community and around the world, how that technology is actually causing business to be disrupted. How many of you remember back when you were a kid and you, and you would dream about when's summer vacation going to happen? Or you think about how long it's going to be until I get a driver's license. Any of y'all ever remember doing that? And it always seemed like it'd be forever before those kind of things would happen, right? Does it seem to you that Perhaps the world's moving a little faster today. Honestly, it's because you're getting older. <laughs> but that's not the only thing. And what we're going to see is there really are things that are moving faster today than, than ever before. For example, back at one point in time, if we ever wanted to increase, for example, the amount of crops that we went out and, and cultivated in the field or we planted in the field, it was just a matter of manpower, right? We had people that go out, and if we want to increase it, what we had to do, okay, I'll go out and hire another person or go another two people. It's a linear progression. 
And then we went from that and we began to use beasts of burden. We began to use horses and cows and you know what, oxen, different things like that to help us. And yes, we could get done, things done faster than we could with just a single human being. But it's still a linear progression. You want to increase the number of crops that you're going to, that you're going to get out of the field? Go get some more animals or go get some more humans. And that's really all that it came down to. When the Industrial Revolution hit, all of a sudden things began to change. One, one person could do the work of 10 people or maybe even 100 people. But there was something else that happened there. Because you see, think about how quickly you could go out and hire a person or, or, or buy another animal to help you, help you plant more crops. When you're talking about building factories or you're talking about building machines, it takes longer. So there's a big time element involved, and not only is there a time element involved, there's a capital expense involved. So it gets expensive. And so as we began putting those factories around the world, there's a big issue. And what, what ends up happening is sometimes companies have had to go out and CEOs have had to almost bet the farm over a decade-long development of a new factory bet the farm because they don't, get, they don't get the results until that factory gets online. And, and they, there may be something that changes in the meantime, or there may be something that they actually were guessing wrong about. Let me give you an example. How many of you heard of the Iridium satellite? Some of you heard of that? Iridium was a company that was actually a spinoff of Motorola. And Motorola spun this company off in the late 80s. And what Motorola was really doing, they were trying to make a, 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 a play to take the entire mobile phone industry and they were going to dominate it. And this move was very much uh, lauded by everyone around. Because see what Motorola had figured out that everybody else hadn't really figured out is that, yeah, we can put a lot of cell phone towers in. It's really not that difficult to do it in these really densely populated areas. But the problem is, if we start talking about areas that are not so densely populated and, and begin moving out away from the cities and we begin moving into the, the farming communities or around the world, it gets expensive because, see, at that time, a cell phone tower cost about $100,000 to put up. And not only did you have that, you had, you had problems with the frequencies and how many frequencies were available and, a lot of, and, and the speed of things there. And for that matter, you remember those brick phones back then? the cost was pretty expensive for them to manufacture. And so what they did is they said, we're going to take and we're going to put a satellite network around. And then there are going to be 77 satellites. That's where the name Iridium came from. Iridium is, a, is an element and that's number 77 on your chemical chart. And we're going to put 77 in the, uh, satellites around the country, or around the world. And that's going to take the place of all the cell phone towers. And, and they figured out how to make that profitable was all we've really got to do is we've got to have a million customers from certain developed countries buy one of these satellite, one of these cell phones, $3,000 a whack, how's that compared to today, and $5 a minute. And that's all we've got to do. So they spun this company off, began working on it. Late 80s, it took them till 98, as I recall, to get the thing finished, about 12 years. Okay, and, and what happened during that 12 year time is they continued working on it. They'd made a bet, okay? And what ended up happening? Well, during that 12 year time period, they really didn't change, keep watching things. They didn't change their strategy. They kept on going with things. They lost $5 billion. And honestly, Motorola wasn't the only one that did it. There, there were a couple of other competitors that jumped into the very same kind of thing, and they lost $5 billion. So there was a total of $10 billion during this time period that was lost because they'd actually bet the company in some ways that the demand is going to outpace the technology. So there's issues when we get into that kind of thing. But you know, that's not the only one. We talked for a moment ago, but how many remember that guy? Zach. Zach, that's right, okay. Saved by the bell, anyway. Um, 
we talked for a moment ago a moment ago about what the technology was like back then. And it was huge. I, I talked to some ladies the other day who in the in the early 80s, their parents had got them a bag phone so they could take it back and forth to college as they were traveling to college. And they told them and said, don't ever use it. It's too expensive to use. And that's the way, I mean, it had to be an emergency for that to happen. Well, back during those days in the 80s, McKinsey and Company was advising AT&T. And they were talking to them about the, AT&T was considering getting in really heavy into the mobile phone market. And McKinsey and Company said, no, don't do it. Because the state of technology and everything, by the time the year 2000 rolls around, there's gonna be less than a million cellular phones. So it, you'd be making a mistake to jump into it. AT&T listened to them. And as a result, one of the biggest, biggest business opportunities they ever had went by the wayside. In fact, McKinsey was so wrong that by the, by the year two, 2000, there were 100 million, over 100 million cell phones out there. And so not only did they miss it by 99%, but also think of what that did really to AT&T. But that's not the only example. Here's another one. There was a study done of the year of the decade, 2000 to 2010, of companies like Gartner and Forrester and, uh, and McKinsey and Jupiter, some of those companies that are very much into, into prognostication and, and, and very well recognized as experts. And here's what happened. In 2002, they projected the, phone, the mobile phone industry would grow by 16% in the next two years. In reality, what happened, the industry grew 100%. So they thought they learned something. In 2004, they did another projection. They said it's going to grow 14% in the next two years. Well, it grew another 100%. In 2006, they projected 12%. It grew another 100%. And you would think they'd get it right by, by the next year, but they didn't. In 2008, they projected a 10% growth, and it grew 100%. And what you see happening is, what we're used to doing so often is we're used to thinking linearly. linearly. That's a hard word to say sometimes. Say it three times real fast. Uh, linearly, that's the way we're thinking. When, when what's happening is really we're experiencing an exponential growth. And you know what? It's not only happening here. I mean, this study was the mobile phone industry, and after they w did that study, they went back and looked, and they've seen it happen in the oil industry and in a number of other industries, the very same kind of thing happened. People are not paying attention to the growth that technology is causing. 